Do you think the U.S. really is warmer this year than it was in the 1930s? No. My guest today is Anthony Watts. And Anthony, I'd like to congratulate you on 538 million views on uh, What's Up With That. And also that uh, when I was digging into this whole scam in, in 06, that your site was a very big part of that. So uh, it was very influential in me uh, learning about what was really going on here. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. I think um, a lot of people in the climate debate know me on both yeah. sides. Um, the, the people that are on the climate alarmist side hate me vehemently. Uh, they accuse me of being on the take uh, from big oil and all that sort of stuff, from which I've never gotten a dime. Uh, they've accused me of being uh, on the take from the Koch brothers. They don't even know who I am, much less sending me money. Uh, so, you know, that's all garbage. But uh, on the on the, the solid side of things, you know, I'm a former television meteorologist I, and also a radio meteorologist. I've spent 35 plus years on the air doing both television and radio. I also was a print journalist for a while. I continue to write articles. Um, for my local newspaper. I just published one last week about the park fire. Uh, and um, that's on WhatsApp with that, where the local, uh, the climate alarmist professor from Chico State University said that uh, the fire was driven by climate change overnight up into Tehama County, as if climate change just swoops right down to that tiny little space there in in Butte County on the, uh, about two miles wide and acts immediately on the fire and nothing else, you know? Crazy stuff like that. So that's what I've been doing with What's Up With That. I've been debunking the crazy stuff, providing references, um, and garnering views. Um, and uh, I've taken a lot of abuse for doing so. Uh, so that's pretty much me in a nutshell right now. I also work for the Heartland Institute, uh, providing them with articles, commentary, research, so forth and so on. The Friday show we do, it's uh, the Climate Realism Show. It's noon uh, Central Time every Friday. Uh, 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're up to about uh, oh, 100 and, 170 so episodes now. Um, I, I've started out being the, the host for that for the most part, but I've taken a back seat as of late. Uh, I find that actually works a little better for me. Jim Lakely is now the host, and he does a great job of that. And he and I play off each other better when he's the host versus uh, me. Being the host. Part of it has to do with the fact that I'm hearing impaired. A lot of people know that. And uh, I have to read closed captioning. And so trying to read closed captioning, run a show, switch to videos and all that kind of stuff, it was just too much. So that's what we're doing these days. Okay. I noticed a, a dog just walked by uh, behind you. That's not a relative of Kenji or Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, Kenji? I saw. Well, that is, that is Kenji too. Um, okay. Uh, the original Kenji passed on in March, and so um, I have a new dog, too, actually, uh, of the same breed, the Japanese Chin. I have not yet registered them with the Union of Concerned Scientists, but I will do so once they have uh, come of age and published a peer-reviewed paper. Fantastic. All right, should we go ahead and uh, go through your presentation? Sure. So this uh, this background graphic is one of my favorite graphics to use because um, it really kind of sums up in one picture the whole climate debate. You know, the whole uh, alarmist side of things is gloom and doom is in our future. You know, drought, fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, you know, the whole works. Our side is about, well, you know, we're living pretty well right now. CO2 is greening the planet. You know, we've got uh, a lot going for us right now. And, and we don't see the climate emergency that these folks basically say exist. Um, I want to talk about some headlines. For, this is from last year on July 5th. Uh, some of these are just beyond ridiculous. Uh, Yahoo News, unprecedented and terrifying. World sets all-time high temperature record two days in a row. Uh, climate scientists, July 4th was the hottest ever for average global temperatures. That are the hottest day in 100,000 years. Oh, no. You know, if, if you read these headlines and believe them, you think, well... Dang, stuff's getting pretty bad, you know? And that's the problem we've got. A lot of folks can't separate the reality from the fantasy that these folks are pushing. And then how many people believe these headlines? Well, more than you think, and that's the unfortunate part. The problem with this particular set of headlines is that it was bogus, and it was based on a model. And this is the model from climatereanalyzer.org. 
Um, and it's not actual data. It's reanalyzed data. It only goes back to 1979. So how do they know from this data, remodeled data, that it was the hottest in 100,000 years? That's just a, uh, a swag, as far as I'm concerned, and probably not at all accurate. So, you know, they push, they, they find some little nugget of half-truth and push it to the point of it being, uh, you know, absurd. Uh, so here's what you didn't see from last year. On Thursday, after that headline uh, came out, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration distanced itself from the designation compiled by the University of Maine Climate Reanalyzer, which uses satellite data, computer simulations, et cetera, et cetera. NOAA's, whose figures are considered the gold standard in climate data, said in a statement, it cannot validate those unofficial numbers. It noted that the reanalyzer uses model output data, which is called not suitable as substitutes for actual temperature and climate records. Now that's from the Associated Press in an update on July 5th after they ran with the, you know, the, the it's terrible headlines. So in the space of two days, it went from temperature data that was totally unprecedented and terrifying to temperature data that was not suitable for purpose. Boom. Womp, womp. Anyway, there was another one. Ancient trees reveal last summer was the hottest in 2000 years. Uh, I wrote an article about that, you know, and there's this reliance on this proxy data. The problem that that proxy data has, particularly tree rings, is that most people don't understand that trees are not an absolute indicator of temperature. Um, you know, in man's hockey stick, um, you know, he, the trees started diverging around 1962 and going down. It actually got colder, according to the trees. So he threw on the the temperature record there at the end in the red. Um, and the problem with with what man did there, more so than the tacking on the temperature at the end from the temperature, surface temperature data, was that his process smoothed out all the natural variations going back thousands of, or hundreds of years. And so the, the medieval warm period is missing, the Roman warm period is missing. That, all that stuff got averaged out to make it look like Climate was absolutely static for almost 2,000 years. And then all of a sudden, whammo, humans are messing it up. But that's not true at all. Climate is highly variable in any given place. And it changes from year to year, from decade to decade, from millennia to millennia. It is not static, as they would have you believe. And here's the proof of that. Um, if you look at proxy temperatures versus carbon dioxide, you see that they're completely split they're, they go in different ways. And so carbon dioxide is not driving temperatures here. Uh, this is from uh, Market et al. in 2013, the black line. And you can see that back towards you know 5,000 to 9,000 years ago, it was warmer than the present. And the atmospheric carbon dioxide was lower. So what's the deal here? Is carbon dioxide driving temperature? Probably not, based on this observation. Now, how many of you believe those headlines? So what else do we got about climate that's exaggerated? Well, pretty much everything. Um, here's one of my favorites. You know, the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies is considered the most, um, how would I say it? Not necessarily trusted, but the most uh, presented temperature record um, out there. And this is what it looks like. You know, it's, it shows back to 1880, and it's, going upwards. Now, this is a couple of years old. It goes back to uh, 2022, so it doesn't have the big spike in it that we got in 2023-2024. But the important point here is, is that this is a highly magnified graph. This is a temperature anomaly graph. When you look at it on a scale of human uh, experience, in the actual temperatures, not the anomaly, the actual temperatures, it's a very, very gradual, slight change in temperature since 1880. And if you show this to people, well, they're not alarmed by this at all. I mean, literally, the temperature differences that we've experienced since 1880 are so small that you probably couldn't discern them from day to day. You know, if we had one day that was the temperature at 1880 and the next day the temperature at 2022, you probably wouldn't be able to discern the difference day to day. It's outside of the ability of human experience to detect. It wasn't until we started using statistics and uh, all these other tricks that we started getting anomalies. 
And, and these kind of exaggerations go on all over the place. Greenland, this is from our website uh, through the Heartland Institute, Climate at a Glance, climateataglance.com has a lot of reference pages. I've built most of them. Um, but here's one of my favorites. And the original graph came from uh, Willis Etchenbach, one of the writers on WhatsApp with that. But, you know, when you look at, oh, my goodness, Greenland ice is melting. The seas are going to rise. It's danger and doom in the future. And look at that steepness of that slope. Well, when you put it in context with all of the ice in Greenland, it's flat. You can't even see it. It's impossible to see at the scale of total ice. So the media and the climate scientists who are now climate activists present these highly magnified graphs to make it look like there's a crisis. And when in fact, in the larger context of everything, and there is no crisis. Tornadoes, same deal. You know, um, this is one of my favorite topics because I used to be a tornado chaser. When I was at Purdue University, I worked with uh, the National um, Severe Storms Lab in Norman, and I developed a, um, a corona electrometer for their TOTO device, which is that totable tornado observatory. Uh, and that was a, a facsimile of that was featured in the original Twister movie, you know, where they push it off the back of the truck. But interestingly enough, um, tornadoes are not getting worse. They're not getting more frequent. What's happened is we have the ability to report them much easier. I mean, think about it. When I first started television 35 years ago, I had a teletype machine and some fax maps um, and, and that was pretty much it. Uh, but now we've got people out there. We, you know, if we had a tornado, some would call in on the phone, right? But they had to get to a phone first or we hope that the phone lines weren't down. Now we've got cell phones everywhere. Literally, there are millions of these out there with cameras and the ability to take video and send it to CNN on a moment's notice. And so what happens is, is that the appearance of more tornadoes is real because it's getting reported more because it's so easy to do. I mean, before the internet and before cell phones, you know, a lot of tornadoes, particularly in the Midwest, went unreported. <laughs> Same thing with hurricanes before the satellite era. They're they're just they weren't reported. So what's been happening is is that we have a strong reporting bias um, with the tornado and the storm activity that makes people think storms are getting worse, and the media, of course, just goes that shit over that. They just love that, right? So heat waves, you know, every summer, reliably, the media will say, it's the hottest ever, it's the worst ever, it's the it's the new normal, you know? But the bottom line is, is that this index coming from the Environmental Protection Agency webpage shows that the heat indexes were far worse in the decade of the 1930s than they are today. And by an order of magnitude, practically. I mean, it's... And that was all natural variation that caused that. So, you know, carbon dioxide had no rule of any significance at that time. But people don't want to look at the past. They only want to look at the present when it comes to the news people. You know, they only uh, seem to be about the here and now. This is also from Climate at a Glance. Uh, methane is a big deal. You know, they want you to stop eating meat because it causes methane, and methane is a greenhouse gas. Well, greenhouse gases, uh, if you look at all of the data, and again, that's what I do. I look at data. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency shows all the data. And so we've got all these other sectors like transportation, electricity generation, industry, commercial, residential, agricultural crops. All of those generate more methane or greenhouse gases than livestock. They represent just 2% of all the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. But to hear the environmentalist and the uh, and the anti-meat people out there, you know, cows are the whole reason that the whole planet is burning up, right? <laughs> so what's the biggest exaggeration of all? Well, it's got to be the fact that temperature really took off about 1960, when you look at this NASA guest graph. I mean, it really started to go off. We had it pretty much the same from 1880 up to around 1938, 35. But then all of a sudden, we start seeing... Yeah, uh, it peaking a little bit, then a drop. Part of that had to do with World War II. Uh, but then all of a sudden, after we had World War II and the baby boomers came and all the expansionism came, we had a tremendous rise in temperature. And that's what I've been studying. I've made this my life for work. This has to do with the fact that we have changed, we have changed the climate locally around where 
we measure temperature. And here's a perfect example. Um, this is in Sandpoint, Idaho. This is a NOAA official temperature sensor used for submitting climate data. It is feet from a radiator from a vehicle being parked. Um, and it's also in the middle of a bunch of pavement and other cars around. Is this a place that climate change should be measured? Well, no, this is completely wrong. And NOAA has its own rules about this. They say that the, a temperature sensor must be at least 100 feet away from any corrupting influence, such as asphalt, concrete, vehicles, air conditioners, so forth and so on. But what I found through all my work is that that's not true at all. So here's what happened. The original location on the left was uh, over at the agricultural research farm with it run by the University of Idaho. Well, that closed, right? And so they had the sensors in this, you know, woody grassy area where it's supposed to be. But NOAA seems more interested in the continuation of the record than they are the quality of the record. So they moved it over to the local airport because someone has to write down the temperatures or call them in by phone every day. They have such an old clunky system. They're still relying on paper and telephones to get this climate data in. And that's the problem. We have an antiquated system. There are thousands of these things throughout the United States. Um, and it's just amazing how many we have here in the United States compared to the rest of the world. I mean, we have an order of magnitude or more stations than the rest of the world. But almost all of them are corrupted in some way. Um, it started out originally with the Stevens and Green of the Cotton Region Shelter on the left there. And those things had problems with paint. That's what really got me interested in this. Because I had to build one of these things when I was at Purdue and I set up the official campus weather station. Um, what they called then the Cherry Lane Meteorological Facility, um, which has now been <laughs> erased because they wanted to build a new racetrack for the you know Indianapolis 500 people or something, I don't know. So they got rid of the weather station out there in the boonies where we originally put it. Uh, and then the other one is the MMTS, which is a max min temperature system, or as the National Weather Service people call it, and I kid you not, the Mickey Mouse temperature system. They call it that because... It's, it's literally a kludge. They don't much like it. And I, I pointed out time and again that NOAA violates its own published standard. They need to have it at least 100 feet away from any concrete or paved surfaces, anything that would influence the temperature. And when I first got started in this, my very first station that I found was south of me in Marysville, California. And I found the MMTS in the middle of a parking lot where the police or the fire chief would pull up his vehicle like you saw there in Sandpoint, Idaho right up to the temperature sensor. And so the radiator was radiating all its heat into the temperature sensor. I could stand next to the temperature sensor and feel warm air coming from the air conditioning exhaust fans that are driving the equipment, you know, cooling the equipment that drives its cell phone tower. They rented out the, the uh, facility there at the fire station for a cell phone tower to get some more money. So we, they added all this electronics equipment. The station was quietly closed after I brought it to light. I mean, there was an uproar over this station uh, because it was just so bad. And they've quietly closed it. Now I've actually done so. They've quietly closed a number of these stations that I've exposed, such as this one in the University of Tucson uh, in um, Arizona, the University of Arizona at Tucson, I should say. This one had been going since like 1857. And it started out because the University of Arizona Tucson was a land grant university, right? And so they had all this land and they had the weather station in the proper location, well away from all of the campus stuff, right? Same thing that happened with me at Purdue when I put out the Cherry Lane Meteorological Facility. It was way away from campus, no influence. And then they start building stuff. They get new grants to make a new building, you know, a new, uh, a new gym or whatever, a new football stadium. And so what happened is this thing kept getting moved time and again. And finally, they ran out of places to put it because they'd used up all the available land. And so what do they do? They put it out in the parking lot in front of the atmospheric sciences department, people that should know better. They put it right on the parking lot. This one was closed, too, after we exposed it. And so I, I went around all around the nation, myself and many volunteers, looking at these stations. And, you know, we found hundreds and hundreds of examples just as bad, if not worse, like this one here um, 
in Woodland, California. That's the Bureau of Weights and Measures for the county there. That's their office. And they've got an MMTS that is, you know, in the middle of a parking lot and right up near the hot roof and everything. You can see how warm it is due to the infrared photo I took. This one, this should be a rural station. This is Arco, Idaho. This is a little town out in the middle of nowhere, right? But the MMTS is right next to a concrete brick wall. And you can see the sun heating that wall up in the infrared photo on the right. Why do they have it there? Well, if you read the, the sign on the side of the wall, the Arco advertiser, that's the newspaper. Why do they have it at the newspaper? Because the newspaper takes on the responsibility of writing down the temperature measurements every day and telephoning them in. They have a warm body in, in, involved in this. And so they try to keep these records going, you know, because they think of them as useful, but they've been so corrupted. I can't see that they're useful at all. Here's another example. The fire station run by Cal Fire at Colfax, California. Now, this used to be a Stevenson screen out in the middle of a grass field when I visited it back in 2008. Now it's an MMTS on top of a rock wall that gets full sun. Well, gosh, where do you think the heat's going? It's going up. This station should be closed, you know? But the people that put these things together don't think of these things. They don't think of these long-term issues. Florida, Fort Pierce, Florida, another MMTS. It's got a whole uh, fan club over there of air conditioners, right? All of them dumping their waste heat into the area where the temperature sensor is. It's a great place to measure climate if you want to assume that the climate is getting hotter. Bias. This one uh, is at a radio station, Grants Pass, Oregon. I actually know the chief engineer there, um, and he told me, he was so upset about the temperature readings, probably because he followed my work back in 2007 and 8. He was so upset about the temperature readings that this particular MMTS sensor on the side of the building above the parking lot was producing. He called the National Weather Service in Medford, Oregon, and asked them to move it. They would not. They refused. And so this thing is still producing crappy temperature data in a place where it shouldn't be measuring temperature at all. Um, and you can see clearly the effect that sunlight has on these temperature centers. Here's just a, a convenience walkway, a piece of concrete put down so that they could easily access the temperature sensor and the rain gauge. This is uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And this was after a rain, surprisingly, uh, and the skies were clouded. You can see that the infrared shows a lot of heat coming off of that concrete. Concrete stores the heat. And here's the whole process. Here's how it works. The sun produces shortwave radiation, what we know as visible light during the day. It shines down on the earth. It heats up the concrete and shelters and so forth. Um, the, the Cotton Region Shelter or Stevenson screen is designed to deflect that light so it doesn't get into the sensor. And the same thing with the MMTS. But the problem is, is that at night, all of that stored energy that went into the concrete or the asphalt or whatever it might be nearby starts re-radiating as long-wave infrared radiation on the right side. And it heats the air near the ground. And so what happens is, is that the low temperature sent by the temperature sensor is not as low as it normally would be had this not this piece of concrete not been there. So what happens is because they use, uh, the climate scientists use the average temperature for tracking climate, the average of the high and the low each day, which then goes out to month and year and decade and so forth, because the average is biased upwards, because the low temperature gets warmer. And so it's not really getting hotter that if you track the highs over the last several decades, they're not getting hotter. And I proved this. I published this at the American Geophysical Union um, back in 2015. And with this graph here, I showed that for 30 years, from 1979 to 2008, the stations that were compliant with siting, you know, out in the fields away from, you know, biases, class one and two, they were in the blue line, had a rate of warming about 0 0.204 degrees centigrade per decade. The rest of them were warmer. And when you look at all of the stations that NOAA uses, it goes up to 0.324 degrees centigrade per decade.
So here's <laughs> about 50% of your climate change right there. It's artificial based on the fact that these temperature sensors have been biased. And I've shown this to NOAA, and they are completely resistant to this idea. They think that they can statistically adjust all of this stuff. Well, that's horseshit. It is. I'm sorry. I get mad about it because you can when you've got 96 percent of the of the network corrupted with heat bias, you can't statistically adjust that stuff out. No matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you believe it, you can't do it. So anyway, rant over. Are we really in a climate emergency? No. You know, 350.org, Bill McKibben and, and the McKibbenites. Uh, they say in their draft declaration, the Paris Climate Accord agreed to keep warming well below two degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels. Well, guess what? A volcano erupted a couple of years ago called Hunga Tonga, and it put a whole bunch of water vapor in the atmosphere, and now we're above that level. But here's the cool thing. If you go back and look at the Berkeley Earth surface temperature data, you'll find that we've already had a two degree C warming since... Uh, around 1820 or so. Well, Europe is still there. It didn't burn to a crisp. What's up with that? It's all about adjusting temperature. And, and then everything that you see presented in the media is adjusted. This is a graph put together by Tony Heller, and he shows this simple animation where the past is adjusted to be cooler. The 1998 temperature, when you see those circled items there, look at the change. This is a statistical adjustment. This is not reality. So what we're being presented as being science is no more than a statistical trick. Seriously. I mean, the scientists believe they're doing the right thing. They believe that these adjustments they are applying, they are applying are correct and so forth. And they write peer-reviewed papers about it that, you know, sort of so-called prove it's correct. But the bottom line is, is that the data has changed. And the data has changed to increase the warming trend. And I, as I pointed out uh, with that EPA graph earlier and talked about with the fact that the temperature record is not getting hotter because all that concrete affects the lows, which affects the average. The highs are not affected. The number of summer record daily maximum set or tied in the United States peaked in the 30s. And we saw another peak, uh, you know, in the early 80s. But so far, it's not there. We're just not getting these high temperature records. They talk about drought as being the worst ever. You know, every summer, drought, worst ever, gloom and doom. But when you look at proxy data without trying to apply temperature for it, you're just looking at the dryness factor. And this is done by Cook et al. Um, and this graph was from the Bay Area News Group a couple of years ago. But this portion down there on the far right end is the part that we're supposed to have due to climate change. But there have been 200-year-long droughts in the American West in the past. Now, imagine if that happened today. You know, Los Angeles would be up the creek without a paddle as far as, far as water goes. Same with San Francisco. And, of course, climate change would immediately be blamed on it. Uh, Man-made climate change, that is. But, you know, it's all natural variation. Sea level is one of the biggest lies out there. And uh, this is from the History Channel. They had Armageddon Week one year. And they showed this picture here where, uh, you know, they show what New York City is going to look like. The battery down at the south end of Manhattan Island. Well, this is what they say it would look like, you know, due to sea level rise in the not-too-distant future. But when you look at the data, you can see that sea level rise has been happening continuously and slowly since about 1857. And it continues that way today. It's a slow 2.85 millimeter per year, right? So using that rate, it's simple to calculate based on the number of stories of buildings that were flooded. And I did this. Based on the rate of change of sea level in New York City, the actual data, not opposed to the models, you know, or anything else, it would take 26,000 years to get to that level. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I got this and a bunch of other stuff in my book, Climate at a Glance for Teachers and Students that I've written with the Heartland Institute. It's available on Amazon.com if you want hard copy, uh, and you can get a free download of it at climateataglance.com.
Yeah, how big a deal is this issue of ghost stations that John Shuchuk is uh, writing about where it might have been 20 years since there actually was a station there, but we're still getting data from that station? Yes, uh, it's true. When it, when I'll have to credit Tony Heller for figuring this out. And when he first published on it, I thought, no, this can't be right. Uh, and I, I challenged him on it, but he's right. And here's the deal. As I pointed out earlier in my talk, NOAA is more interested in the continuation of the record than they are in the quality of the record. So what have they been doing? Station closes, like some of those ones that I've exposed that are so terrible that you know, they get embarrassed by it. They close those stations, and then their, their algorithm, uh, which is called homogenization, creates new data for this station based on stations in the area, right? It's, it's basically just an estimate of what the data would be based on surrounding stations. So they're making up data and publishing it. Now, they put a little flag on the data and say that this data is, you know, an estimate. But some people don't notice that. Some people don't care, you know, because it fits their agenda. But if you take out all these estimated stations, um, the data looks different. So is that honest? I don't think so. I really don't. I don't think it's honest of, of NOAA to publish this data with reconstructed non-existent temperature data in it. So Willie soon talks about this guy over in Europe named uh, Peter O'Neill, who would download uh, the data set, the full data set every day for quite some time. And he would notice day after day that there were unexplained changes in the past data. Do you think that... Uh, Whoever's maintaining that data just is free to uh, change data in the past with no reason that this is what they do? I don't know who Peter O'Neill is. I haven't followed his work, so I can't really comment on that question. But I can say that all of the data, here's one thing that most people don't un understand and realize, that all of the surface temperature data in the world goes to NOAA in the United States. It goes to the National Center for Environment. Environmental Information, NCEI, used to be the National Climatic Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina. That's where they assimilate it all, and that's where they process it. And their processes are what change this data. Okay. But we're told that there's all these different data sets, and all of them agree about the warming. But they're, well, they're really all from aren't. the same yeah. stuff. It's just a different flavor. It's like, you know, you can make barbecue sauce with 100 different flavors, right? Everybody's got the new greatest wonderful barbecue sauce, you know, uh, the the Gavin Schmidt Gist barbecue sauce. Well, it's different than the, the uh, Berkeley Earth surface temperature barbecue sauce. Same base ingredients, different flavor. That's what's going on here. How about this deal where the UK supposedly hit 40 degrees centigrade and uh, some it's FOIAs went out and it was uh, near a tarmac and there were uh, fighter jets landing there and the temperature lasted for one minute and then it cooled. Is yeah. that... Uh, could yeah, that have happened in the 40s as well? Is that how they did max and minimum, that if it hit uh, some temperature for one minute in the 1940s, would we have known about that if a warm wind went no, by? A, no, no, because here's the, here's the deal. We have gone from a temperature measurement system globally that was dominated by mercury thermometers to get the high and the low for each day. Now, these mercury thermometers had a little metal peg in them, and there was a two thermometers one for the minimum and one for the maximum. And the mercury, as it would rise or fall, would move that little iron peg inside the capillary tube, right? And from its, and then when the, the temperature would go down, the mercury would receive, recede, that little peg would stay in the last place that it was the highest or the lowest, right? So it was a very slow process. It takes time to heat up mercury. Mercury has mass. So a one-minute temperature change, such as exhaust from a fighter jet, wouldn't register on these mercury thermometers. Now we have these electronic thermometers, the MMTS that I showed you, uh, which have platinum resistant, resistive elements, which have very low mass, which can change literally in the tenth of a second. Um, and so a gust of wind blowing hot air by can create a new high temperature that isn't representative of the day. It's just representative of a of a wind event, you know, or a jet going by or whatever. And so that gets added to the average. And um, it's it's so not only is our surface temperature being biased by the concrete and asphalt bringing the low up, it's being biased by 
transient temperature spikes in the highs because the thermometers are so much more time sensitive than what they were in the past. Okay. And how much difference do you think there would be for people honestly trying to read the temperatures in the 40s and they're looking at the thing and uh, they're trying to, I don't know if they're trying to record it down to the 10th of a degree or uh, what's the margin of error just reading it, do you think? Well, here's the other fun fact that most people don't realize about NOAA's temperature network in the United States. They round the temperatures off, the highs and the lows, to the nearest digit. They don't work, they don't look at tenths. So we have a, a plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit reading for any temperature. So if, it, if the high today was 75.6 degrees, they'll round it up to 76. If the low was 37.8 degrees, they'll round it up to 38. You know, or, you know, you know, it's just, this is the kind of, of silliness that goes into these numbers. And so they've got a built-in, um, they've got a built-in uncertainty with them right away, right off the bat. Probably shouldn't even ask this one, but how, uh, how much do you believe the estimates of absolute global average temperature? Sometimes they tell us a number. Sometimes they tell us a wildly different number. Uh, can can anyone honestly figure that out right now? With the data that we have, no. Um, I don't think we can. I, the, the closest we can get, I believe, is the satellite temperature data set done by Dr. Christie and Spencer out of the University of Alabama, Huntsville. Now, what they're measuring is the lower troposphere. And they're doing that by satellite microwave measurements. And the value of that particular method is that it get it, since it's not looking at the surface, it's looking at about a 14,000 feet elevation in the lower troposphere, they then are getting a noise-free environment. So, you know, the atmosphere mixes and everything. So if the globe is, in fact, getting hotter, we would see it in that particular signal. It, it's not so full of noise. Interestingly enough, the rate of change in temperature, the slope warming recorded in the UAH data, is very close to what I discovered in the data that has not been corrupted in the surface temperature network, the one that I showed you in that graph before, in the blue. They're pretty close. So when you've got two things that agree like that, you know, good data from two different sources, you have to think, you know, the whole thing is a bit overhyped. We have about 50% less global warming than the media and the climate activists would like you to believe. Uh, is there any move afoot to create a new data set, even for the U.S., that's composed of just high-quality stations, or is that not a thing? Well, here's another fun fact most people don't know about. There is such a network. It's called the U.S. Climate Reference Network, USCRN. It's 114 stations scattered throughout the United States. They are in properly sited locations, away from humanity, away from the you know, concrete, asphalt, automobiles, and so forth, and so on. Now, NOAA does not publish this. Well, they, they do, but it's, it's kind of hidden in their website. You have to know to look for it. Instead, they still publish the all the other data from all these crappy stations out there that they have adjusted using a baseline signal from the Climate Reference Network. So they're trying to make the temperature data better by using this fantastic network over here as a reference to adjust it. Well, that does not solve any real problems. The network has only been in place since 2005. And so it's not going to help all of the temperature records from 2005 back to 1880. Those are still biased slowly by the advent of humanity building up more and more infrastructure. So if we could get a global US CRN and just switch to that, we'd be far better off. We wouldn't have to worry about the bias, the noise, the transients, the jet exhaust, or any of that stuff. So are the actual locations of both the bad and the good data stations, are they publicly available or, or do they not want people visiting and taking pictures? Well, yeah, another fun fact is when I first started doing this back in 2007, there was a, um, a minimal database that NOAA had published about the location of these stations. And when I announced that I was doing this project, within two weeks of me starting it, they disappeared that database saying that, well, we don't want people, you know, tramping into, uh, some of these stations are in people's yards. 
it's the cooperative observer network is in people's yards at farmhouses and so forth. So Noah didn't want us to be violating the privacy of these people. You know, we didn't, they didn't want us publishing the names of these people, you know, and so forth and so on. Well, I, I took, I, I solved that problem real quick. I said, okay, so you guys are worried about us taking pictures of temperature stations and their biases, you know, exposing people and so forth and so on. But you publish a quarterly newsletter called the Cooperative Observer Newsletter that shows people standing in front of their station with their name and their location. And you're worried about me? Anyway, they go, all right, all right. And they put it back online. And to their credit, they've gotten better. Uh, they have now the uh, what's called the HOMR database. Um, Historical Observation Metadata Repository, Homer. And if you, if you just search for NOAA and Homer, H-O-M-R, you'll find it. And this shows the location of every weather station in the United States and some overseas as well. And they've got reasonably good latitude and longitude coordinates from GPS and so forth and so on, on there. And this is because I challenged them on it. Um, you, you look at the data, you know, that the sustained period of heat throughout the Midwest and much of the United States during the 1930s, far greater than what we experienced this year. Um, and, you know, we've had some over 100 plus days and so forth and so on, but these are not unique in the record. Do you think there's any reason to believe that the 1930s heat was just in the U.S. and uh, that was a, a big anomaly and it wasn't warm elsewhere in the 1930s in the globe? It was mostly a North American anomaly, yes. But it goes to show that weather is the driving thing behind this. You know, this was a, a, a period of sustained weather pattern that caused an anomalously high temperature. And weather is still the driver for everything. You know, climate is nothing more than a statistical construct. It is an average of weather over time. So, you know, there is no, like I, I talked about writing that op-ed where I said that Chico State professor had said, you know, climate change pushed that fire north into Tehama County. Well, climate has no component that acts in the atmosphere. It's not a living, breathing thing. It's a statistical construct. And so climate doesn't drive anything, weather does. Do you think that any of the warm and cold periods over the last 2,000 years were absolutely global, that it was warm everywhere, somewhere, or cold everywhere, or have there been holes and anomalies kind of in all of them? I wonder. Well, that's a tough one to answer because proxies are so horribly uh, unreliable, particularly the tree ring proxies. I think that we've had periods of colder temperatures, but whether they were global or not, I don't know. Um, one of the things about tree ring proxies that people need to understand is that a tree is a plant, just like, you know, a beanstalk or a corn plant or whatever. And the things that make a plant grow are water, sunshine, available nutrients, and temperature. Four things. Four, these are the four major things. There's other things, but those are the four biggies, right? And so if you have uh, a tree and it has a particularly cold year, you might say, oh, well, you know, it didn't grow and make a big tree ring because it was cold. Or if it had a big wide tree ring, oh, obviously it grew because it was warmer that year. And they, they go up to these places like Yamal, uh, the Yamal Peninsula and so forth to get these trees, which are, you know, old. Problem is, is that with all those four things, you don't know which one of those actually affected the tree in a particular year. I mean, it could have had less rainfall. It could have had less sunlight. Could have been cloudy that year, uh, per, you know, perennially cloudy. It could have had um, more fertilizer. Or a reindeer came by and decided that was a good place to have a pit stop, right? You know, and so there's more fertilizer. And so it grew more that year. You cannot go back and look at trees and say it is an absolute indicator of temperature. That is just impossible. And pretty much what man did is throw out the trees that didn't give him the answer he wanted, right? Isn't that what happened? That's pretty much it, yes. And there was a brief selection. Uh, Steve McIntyre uh, found this one tree that had such phenomenal growth that it was so wildly anomalous that they included in there that it skewed the whole temperature record up. If they'd taken that one tree out, the whole thing would have been different. He called it the most influential tree in the world, and it was up on the 
Yamal Peninsula. And again, the growth that thing experienced might have been due to the fact that, like I said, reindeer stopped by. Who knows? You can't say absolutely. It was temperature. Uh, on a separate issue, uh, what do you think is going on with the Atlantic sea surface temperatures? There's just an article came out since June began. It's been a half uh, degree or two Fahrenheit colder than normal for this time of year. Any ideas what's causing that or just more natural variability? Uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm not an oceanographer and I don't play one on TV, so I don't really know. I do not either. Okay. Uh, overall, do you think, uh, in your experience, are we kind of uh, winning or losing in the climate debates, or what do you see happening from your perspective? Well, it it become polarized. I think we're winning with thinking people, people that are actually interested in looking at the causes, looking at the data, and so forth. Well, from the non-thinking people, well, we're losing that battle. I mean, we've got, you know, politicians that go out and make grand pronouncements based on what they think is going to happen, you know, based on what somebody told them. And then, you know, they try to turn that into some kind of a, a bill or a law or whatever. And so we're losing there. The only way that we're going to win is to be more influential. And this is why I encourage people to write letters to the editor. You see somebody writing an article in the newspaper or a magazine that's, you know, bogus, and you know it's bogus because of, you know, something else you've learned. Well, push back on it. Don't let them get away with it. Write an article. Write a letter. Push back. That's the only way we're going to win this. Very good. Any other points you'd like to make before we wrap this one up? Um, well, um, when I first started doing this back in 2007, I talked to the chief meteorologist at the Sacramento National Weather Service office started asking her about temperature centers and so forth. And she said something that was very profound. Her name was Elizabeth Morse. And she said something very profound that I keep in my head to this day. She said, you know, Anthony, the more you look into temperature, the weirder it gets. And she's right. All right. Very good. On that note, we'll end. But thank you very much. And thanks for all the work you've done. I'm a big fan of what you've done. You've done great work for many years. Talk to you thank next you. time. Thank you. Anthony Watts. Bye.